Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about carbonate reservoirs and their challenges. This is a request that I've gotten through Instagram on discussing carbonate reservoirs and their challenges, and I thought I would give a brief presentation. This is a very broad question in discussing carbonate reservoirs in general. So I'm just gonna go over the high level stuff, and then I'm going to go directly to the challenges and make this a short and sweet presentation. I'll talk about the significance of carbonate reservoirs. A significant portion of the world's oil reserves are found in carbonate reservoirs. Many of these are located in the Middle East, Libya, Russia, Kazakhstan, and North America. Some very large oil fields have carbonate reservoirs, including the largest conventional oil field in the world, the Gawar field of Saudi Arabia. The reason for very large of some carbonate reservoirs is not surprising when one considers of sheer skill for even modern carbonate settings. There are a couple bullets to talk about the Bahamas and the Jolters K oil I wanted to start off what exactly is a carbonate reservoir so we're all on the same page. They originate from calcareous skeletons of organisms forming bioclastic sediments. These fragments are cemented by carbonate precipitating from water. Most of the organisms lived on the bottom of the shallow marine water where algae were present. However, after dying, the organisms may have fallen into greater depth than accumulated. Below a certain depth, 4,000 to 6,000 meters, all carbonate is dissolved as a result of high pressure. This comes directly from well locking and formation evaluation. Now I'll talk about types of carbonate reservoirs. Shallow marine carbonates. The rate of skeletal production in shallow marine water is generally high. These skeletons break down due to action by crustaceans, fish, or by turbulence. The effect of, is to generate the carbonate sediment that may have transported to the final place of deposition. The sediment may have been modified by burrowing organisms. Fecal pellets and so generated may form grains and hence result in porosity. Deep water carbonates. Deep water carbonates are just deposited at depth below that which photosynthesis occurs. Typically, the sediments are formed from oozes consisting of skeletons and pelagic organisms. Reefs. Reefs are built by calcium carbonate, secreting organisms growing on the remains of previous generations. The large skeletal organisms generally remain in place after death, and this may result in the formation of cavities partially filled with sediment. Most reef sediment is produced by segmented or non-segmented organisms, such as bivalves, brachiopods, formifera, that grow in spaces left by larger skeletal organisms. Now I'll talk about the difference between carbonate and sandstone reservoirs. The main difference between carbonate and classic reservoirs is that classic deposition requires the transportation of grains to the sedimentary basin, whereas carbonates originate within the basin of deposition. Carbonate sediments have several features that set them apart by comparison with siliciclastics. Carbonate sediments tend to form and be deposited in situ with enormous volumes of calcareous material provided by depth disintegration, or digestion of plant and animal matter. The coarser material tends to not be widely spread or abraded by waves and currents. Consequently, uniform grain sorting is not a major characteristic of carbonates. There can be a great diversity of grain sizes and shapes in most carbonate sediments compared to sandstones. There are some similarities to siliciclastic environments. Various sedimentary bodies such as beaches, barrier islands, shelf sediments, gravity flows, and dune sands are also found in carbonate settings. Since the effect of classic deposition is to typically cloud the water while making the environment unsuitable for organisms relying on photosynthesis, it usually is not possible to have carbonate and clastic reservoirs coexisting. However, it is of course possible for one to be overlying another due to changes in the environment or deposition over geologic time. I'll talk about challenges to carbonate reservoir development. They generally have poorer recoveries than siliciclastic sediments. A combination of depositional geometry and diagenesis creates highly heterogeneous reservoirs. They can have lower primary recoveries as connected volumes may already be limited with no contact to a large aquifer. The lower energy drive mechanisms such as solution gas drive are common. Heterogeneity at all reservoir scales can make them a challenge to model it's not easy task to make the reliable predictions about the production performance. 
Reservoir management is difficult because the accurate targeting of production and injection wells is problematic, and the sweep may be as a result of this. I'll now talk about the chart that's over here in discussing unfavorable for reservoir development and why it's favorable for reservoir development. There's highly heterogeneous reservoirs. They do not generally have aquifers, tend to oil wet behavior, brittle rocks and commonly fractured, common high frequency cycles on a meter cycle, shingle geometries can be present, and diagenesis can significantly modify the original depositional connectivity in the carbonate sediments. It's unfavorable for reservoir development because they generally have lower recoveries than sandstone reservoirs, it's difficult to locate wells, they have poor primary recoveries, early water breakthrough and high water production rates, you can form thief zones with rapid water breakthrough, you have numerous hydraulic units in highly layered reservoirs, and you have potential to create bypassed oil volumes, particularly in shingled oolites. And cementation can reduce porosity. But there are a couple benefits in that fractures can create widespread connectivity in an otherwise heterogeneous matrix rock, and dolomitization can potentially create good connectivity by modifying fine-grained sediments. So you may ask the question, how do you produce a carbonate reservoir? Well, carbonate reservoirs typically have complex pore structures, so the production wells typically have high production in the early production stage, but they decline rapidly. So it's highly challenging to achieve accurate interpretation results. Primary recovery estimates have large errors due to different pore size distributions and reservoir heterogeneities. However, secondary recovery estimates are more promising, but the effect of fracturing and the channeling must be considered to avoid bypassing large reservoir volumes. And then thermal recovery for tertiary recovery treatment is a possibility. Now here are all the sources that I use for this presentation. Again, as I mentioned, this is a high level presentation on carbonate reservoirs and their challenges, but this is just to give an overview of what kind of challenges to look forward to when developing one of the most common reservoir types in the world. As usual, please be sure to like this video, subscribe so you can get more content in oil and gas and professional development topics, and please be sure to comment on the video below on the YouTube platform so I can incorporate your feedback into future videos. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. And I'll see you in the next one.